The Cold War was defined by a world split into two halves, East and West. Except that isn't really true, since some countries tried to remain neutral and, well, uninvolved. An example of one of these states, one that picked neither side of the Iron Curtain, is Burma, present-day Myanmar. For the Burmese government, their reason to try and remain neutral was because their hands were already full fighting a myriad of political insurgencies and militant separatists, and they just didn't want to invite further trouble. I'm your host David, and this week we're going to look at how Burma, who began their independence with such promise, became a land of countless conflicts, some of which still last to this day. This is The Cold War. A sponsor with tasty snacks? How could I say no? Boxu is a monthly snack box subscription service that delivers original assortments of premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings right to your door. Every month, you'll receive a box with a different theme. The snacks will always be different, so it becomes a new gourmet journey through Japan every month. This month's box, Prefecture Passion, will take you on a tasting tour of the various different prefectures of Japan. My favorite is the Yuzu Salt Koijarare, a rice cracker with a delicious flavor. With the holidays approaching, Boksu makes a perfect gift for anyone in your life who appreciates Japanese snacks and culture, especially during a time where people aren't able to travel as easily as they might like. Actually, not only would you be gifting them Boksu, which is already awesome, but you would also be gifting them the chance to win free tickets to Japan, because Boksu is having a giveaway. They will be picking a lucky winner to win free tickets, and anyone who's subscribed before December 31st is automatically entered. Don't forget to use our code COLDWAR10 and the link in the description to get 10% off and save up to $47 on your own authentic Japanese subscription box from Boksu. We'll start the story in 1942, when the Empire of Japan invaded and occupied Burma, which until that point had been a part of the British Empire for over a century. By August of 1943, the Japanese had declared an independent state of Burma. This was of course a blatant lie, as a puppet government had been installed under the leadership of Ba Ma, and was firmly guided by the hand of the Japanese military. The Burmese came to realize over time that their so-called liberators had no intention of actually granting them real independence, and various resistance groups were formed, each with the purpose of liberating Burma or die trying. The most prominent of these groups and one which would become a major player in post-war Burma was the anti-fascist organization, the AFO, later reorganized into the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League, the AFPFL. It was formed in Pegu in August 1944 by the leaders of the Communist Party of Burma, the Burma National Army, the BNA, and the People's Revolutionary Party. The AFPFL worked together with the British and other Allied forces to oust the Japanese, and AFPFL leader General Aung San was to become a key figure in later securing Burmese independence. As we move forward into 1945, the situation in Burma had totally changed. The land had been retaken by Allied forces, together with the AFO and the BNA, who remained loyal to General Aung San. Two other major players, along with the aforementioned AFO, were now in control of Burma. They were the Allied Land Forces of Southeast Asia ALF -SCA, led by the Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, and the British Civil Affairs Service of Burma CASB, dominated by the Governor-in-Exile Reginald Dorman Smith. However, these two wartime allies each had different plans about what post-war Burma should look like. The army viewed Burma as a stepping stone from which to launch new offensives against the Japanese, still in control of the rest of Indochina. The CASB, on the other hand, was focused on a restoration of colonial rule and, in the true divide-and-conquer spirit British imperial rule, showed favoritism towards the ethnic minorities of Burma, whom they considered to have remained loyal to the British. This was in contrast to the Burmese nationalists, who had collaborated at one point with the Japanese and were viewed as traitors and openly treated with hostility by the CASB as a result. The AFO-AFPFL, for their part, wanted a free Burmese state 
and was more than willing to fight against the British, and any other colonial power for that matter, to achieve their goal. As the Allied forces moved further into the rest of Southeast Asia, AFPFL guerrillas and CAS agents raced against each other to towns and villages to establish local administration, and sometimes even clashed against each other. Of course, the major powers weren't the only ones hatching plans for the future of Burma. Various ethnic minorities, like the Karens, were hoping that they could establish their own independent states. Keep in mind that Burmese society by that time was armed to the teeth, with estimates of between 30 to 50,000 weapons in private hands. The population was also politically mobilized and facing a severe economic crisis. Peace seemed impossible under these conditions, but Mountbatten, CES officials, and many Burmese leaders agreed that it was in everyone's best interest to restore law and order first, and then to defuse the local power struggles. Even with a general focus on bringing peace, the two sides continued to vie for dominance in the political realm as well as over the newly formatted army. In October 1945, the colonial government in exile returned, and Sir Reginald Dorman Smith resumed his position, now tasked with the implementation of the White Paper on Burma that the British government had issued on May 17th. This paper outlined the three-stage independence program Britain had developed for Burma. The first stage was a three-year interim period under the Emergency Administration of 1942, and would possibly include a council that would have Burmese representation. Possibly. At the end of this three-year period, elections would be held for a new government. Then the Burmese could write a new constitution and discuss with Britain about the control of the frontier areas. The frontier areas were areas populated by other ethnic minorities and who enjoyed some degree of autonomy, many who were now looking for their own independent states. The inclusion of these lands in the new Burmese state was a controversial point and, as you might expect, the origin of many of the regional conflicts that were to occur over the following decade. Now, the last part of the white paper outlined that, at a yet unscheduled date, Burma would be granted independence as a dominion within the British Commonwealth, similar to Australia or Canada. The return of colonial government, however, didn't mean that order returned with it. The country was still in chaos, and effective authority could not be established as there were no existing mechanisms for rule in a land that had been devastated by war. With the state unable to enforce the law, crime ran rampant, and as the economy deteriorated day by day, it fueled discontent and animosity towards those in control. It had become apparent, even by the early months of 1946, that the colonial government could no longer hold Burma if the AFPFL took up arms against it. Thankfully for the British, this possibility never actually happened. What did happen, though, was a police strike in July that, by August, had turned into a nationwide strike crippling the colony and forcing the administration to close ports, railroads, and government offices. These events led to the sacking of Dorman Smith, who was replaced by Sir Hubert Rance, who formed a new government largely comprised of AFPFL representatives. And with that, any lingering delusions that Britain could hold onto her Burmese possessions were dispelled. The acceptance that they would be unable to respond militarily in case of an insurrection and the changing winds in the British government paved the way for a political settlement. A Burmese delegation under Aung San went to Britain and on the 27th of January 1947, they reached an agreement with British representatives. The London Agreement, as it was named, like so many others, promised independence to Burma, although again no specific date was mentioned. As part of this agreement, however, the Burmese would be able to choose if they wanted to be part of the Commonwealth or not. Though a diplomatic victory for Aung San, not everyone was satisfied with the resulting treaty. Out of the blue, two prominent Burmese political figures, U Sa and U Ba Sein, neither having shown any previous sign of disagreement, declared they didn't want to sign the treaty, though their opposition had little effect at that time. Returning to Burma, Aung San had to face another equally, if not more, difficult task. This was the inclusion of the frontier areas into the future Burma. These areas included the Shan states that had already formed their own federation and now wanted to negotiate their relationship with the new regime. 
They were also home to other people like the Qin and the Kachin who wanted their own separate autonomous states. In February, Aung San reached an agreement with their leaders. The Panglong Agreement, signed on February 12th, which is still celebrated in Myanmar as Union Day, promised full autonomy regarding the administration of these people's lands and defined modern Myanmar's borders. However, others, like the Karens and the Mons, aspired to create fully independent states, and the Mons even started to appeal to foreign governments for aid. A particular note should be made about the Karen people. Whereas for the Shan, the Qin, and the Kachin, it was easy to define their homeland, for the Karen it would be a Herculean task. With the exception of pockets in the hill country that could be identified as strictly Karen, most of them lived in the lowlands mixed with other ethnic groups, mostly Burmese. Those who did not see any prospects for their people in a united Burma formed the Karen National Union and announced that they would not take part in the upcoming April elections. As such, their seats on the Executive Council that were reserved for Karens went to those who supported the Union. The London and the Panglong Treaties were undoubtedly diplomatic triumphs for Aung San, but they also resulted in the formation of an opposition born out of mostly jealousy against him. The most prominent of Aung San's political rivals was Wu Sa, who had once served as Prime Minister in pre-occupation Burma. Sa heavily distrusted Aung San because of the latter's collaboration with the Japanese during the early days of the occupation. Unlike others, however, Sa did not limit himself in just speaking against Aung San, but organized and then ordered his assassination. At 10.30 on the morning of the 19th of July, four gunmen entered the Secretariat building in Rangoon and murdered Aung San and eight other members of his cabinet. Though the authorities immediately cast their suspicions on communists, it didn't take long to find out that the man behind Aung San's assassination was Wu Sa. The amount of incriminating evidence was overwhelming, and he was arrested the same day. In fact, the plethora and clarity of evidence identifying Sa as the ringleader soon led to speculation that he was framed and that the true killer was another of San's political rivals, the British. The whispers about British involvement were so pervasive that the governor, Sir Hubert Rance, was forced to declare publicly that neither he or the British government had anything to do with the assassination. He later set up a special tribunal under which Sa was convicted for his crimes and sentenced to death. A year later, the Burmese authorities would implement the sentence, hanging him at insane jail on the 8th of May. Now, the dream for Burmese independence did not die with Aung San. On the contrary, it seems that the process was actually accelerated. The new constitution was ready by the end of the month, and it was unanimously approved on September 24th. The following day, Nu was elected to lead the new state as the prime minister, and the assembly decided, once again unanimously, to sever their ties with Britain entirely and not participate in the Commonwealth. Finally, on the 4th of January 1948, independence was declared. This was a victory for the Burmese, but like in so many other newly decolonized states around the world, independence on its own wasn't going to solve the myriad of challenges Burma faced and a new, more chaotic period in Burmese history was about to begin under the new regime. And this is where we're going to leave the story this week to pick up again when we will discuss the chaotic and yet ultimately defining decade in Burmese history. We hope you've enjoyed this first part, but to make sure you don't miss the conclusion and all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have collaborated with who you thought were your allies only to find out that they didn't have your interests at heart so you then sided with your former friend to get rid of the new guys, all in the hope of pressing the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.